Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I'm your host, Jeff Yan. In this episode, you will hear part one of my conversation with John Regan from Boston University. More links and information about today's conversation can be found on Digication's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Full episodes of Digication Scholars Conversations can be found on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I am your host, Jeff Yan. My guest today is John Regan. He is the Master Lecturer in the Department of Rhetoric at the College of General Studies at Boston University, and he serves at the College's Director of ePortfolio and Assessment. Welcome, John. Oh, thank you, Jeff. I'm really, I'm, I'm just uh, overjoyed to be here. Really excited for today. Well, John, you and I had gone, you know, way back. Uh, I we've we've known each other since I started. You know, we started working with uh, Boston University fairly shortly after the, you know, the the almost have been from the beginning of working with Boston University, which is over a decade at this point. Yes. I think that we, you know, we had met, and subsequently we've. We've worked with each other a lot and have seen you. Um, you know, we see each other a lot at conferences, conferences and, yeah. and and so on. And uh, I've always just had such a wonderful time um, hanging out with you and learning from you and talking to you. And so I'm really, really glad that you can join us today. Oh, it's great to be here. And I've, uh, since 2009, Jeff. Yep, we that's go, right. We, we, we go way back. And, um, you know, I do a lot with my students in the library, and the head librarian called me a library stalwart. And I love that. And then you once called me a digication pioneer. So I kind of like that, too. I have to put that, in, you know, hopefully uh, years ahead in my obituary. That'll be like oh. a, a headline there. So. Um, so, but, uh, no, it's just a, it's it's been joyful. And we had so many good times at conferences, great conversations, and fun as well. Remember Armadillo Racing in Fort Worth, Texas? That's yeah. right. And, um, <laughs> that's That was quite an experience. And, I mean, we can't forget. I mean, we both love food. <laughs> and so, <laughs> that's so right. We, we, we'd had plenty of great meals at, uh, at uh, these uh, conferences, too. And they were just so enjoyable, good. you know, to be with good food, good company. You know, I mean, those days, I mean, they, they've got to come back after after COVID is more more under control. We're getting yeah, looking, there. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, well, as you know, we also had uh, recently um, uh, talked to Natalie uh, McKnight, also from Boston University. She's your dean. Um, Correct. And actually, during that um uh, that conversation, we talked about you as well. You know, you've always been a pillar and a rock star in that program. So I'm really glad that we're able to get you on here. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about just, you know, what you do at Boston University and sort of, you know, we'll, we'll start there. Okay. Well, as, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a kind of a, um, a thumbnail sketch of our of our program. Um, if if anyone would like to hear more, I recommend Natalie McKnight's um, uh, two episodes with you that were just really I thought terrific in explaining uh, really the values and ethos of our program. So, um, but I, I teach at the College of General Studies. We have a, a, a two year program for students. It's a general education program, and it uses a team structure. And so I'm on a team with another rhetoric faculty member, a humanities professor, and a social science professor teaching first-year students. And I'll tell you this, once you go team structure, you don't want to go back. I came up through the ranks at the traditionally structured uh, departments, and there's just so, uh, now that I've gone team, I just, I, I, I just love it. You really... Uh, working, you know, directly with other faculty members across disciplines um, is just so exciting and rewarding. And then I get a fuller sense of the students. In the old days, when I used to teach, like in the English department at a, at a place, I, students took all different classes. I never knew what they took. And it was hard to you know, I didn't even think about what they took, to be honest with you. <laughs> Sorry to admit that. But now at the College of General Studies, you really think more holistically about their education and about themselves as students. And it ranges from the practical or pragmatic where you might be able to, oh, they have a big midterm for this class. Since they all have the same class, you could shift when your papers do. And the students appreciate that versus and also making connections across the curriculum. 
And that's that's probably been the single most exciting part is, again, so if I'm teaching, and I know Natalie mentioned World War I, I do a major project with World War I rhetoric. Meanwhile, in humanities, they're maybe doing All Quiet on the Western Front or uh, World War I poets. And then in social science, they're really doing a deep dive into the you know um, ideological conflicts between the, the warring parties. So it's just a... It, 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 it's a remarkable program. I, I agree that it is remarkable. Um, um, by the way, you, I will come back to you having to tell us about you as well, because you know you told us about the program, which is all very good. Oh. Um, but I, I must say that there is um, plenty of just real evidence of your students doing really incredible things. Um, uh, one of your students, in fact, I remember, um, well, you all, I think you remember too. Um, yeah. We were at a showcase event. Um, and um, do you want to tell the story? Um, you, had a, we had a, you had a showcase event. I came to BU to, to participate as an audience to, to watch. Um, do you remember? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I was, I totally. Yeah, oh, I mean, please, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, I was really blown away by one of our students' portfolios, and uh, it was uh, it was really incredible. And I we had a um, uh, an event for the um, able. Um, the e- National ePortfolio Group. And we held an event at at uh, at our college, and I was scheduled to speak. But I I really one thing I've always liked to do is not only hear from students when I'm at conferences, but try and incorporate them in my work. And you, it's really not contrived because they they do such amazing work. So um, so I contacted the student who was not in my classes. And uh, and her e-portfolio was amazing. And didn't Jeff didn't Salbus uh, have like a million hit uh, views? Yeah, it was incredible. It was incredible. And she documented it, it's it's the most fascinating e-portfolio because I know in e-portfolio terms they often often talk about you know collection selection reflection. Well, with with Salma, she put everything up there. It was her entire Boston University experience. And she talked about going to Egypt and looking for um, uh, um, advocates for women's rights in Egypt. And it was almost like a detective story because she had to go around and ask secretly about about people. She talked about all her uh, um, extracurricular work, I think, uh, putting together a TED Talk conference. It was her whole experience. And I always thought that if someone wanted, it was so, so thoroughly documented that if someone wanted to really do a deep dive into what, say, the Boston University experience is like, or what, you know, a university experience is like, it's there. I mean, it's there as, a, as kind of an amazing archive. And I made a joke to you that uh, she was so fantastic, you should give her a car or something. I was just teasing, and then you hired her. <laughs> That's right. Um, it, she was she was amazing, and I I actually found that that was possibly one of the earlier portfolios. This is a few years ago yeah, now. Right. Uh, this is one of the earlier portfolios where you know students are veering off of uh, the the sort of expectation that your portfolio has to have the format of this is the about me page, here's yeah, right, the resume, right. here's a, you know, like a couple of samples of my work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, hers, I remember so clearly that it's almost like she just had this genuine excitement about exploring these things that she feel like she needs to explore. She feels yeah. like the world needs to know about you know, the life of um, uh, a female living in Egypt. And she's, she's an Egyptian, you know, uh, uh, um, um, uh, she's, uh, her, her family is Egyptian. She's Egyptian and she lives in the U.S., but, you know, she wants to explore what that was like. Right. Um, so she went there. And, and then she talked about, you know, putting together a, a TED Talk at, at BU, um, which is a big project and, right. you know, getting it all working and, and but but those are the types of things that you know the content was so rich and so genuine it did not feel this is this is the the, the difference it was not as an example of what she could do it is who she is right and that's no, I, what drove us to be so interested yeah. in hiring her yeah. because it's um you know like the i feel like that students 
whether it be in college or even at K-12 level, should not be thinking about things like these are examples of what I could do. Why not just do it? Why not just do the thing that you, you like to do and that you're passionate about and use that as this is who I am? And I actually think that for us, you know, it's obviously, you know, you know, she's she's got the skills, she's got the she she's got the the, the ability to do the work that we want her to do, but um it's also the cultural fit, the 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 sort of alignment in in values. Um, those are the kind of things that, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a self selection, and I love that because I'm gonna guess that some of the things that she might do, you know, if she showed it to a certain employer, they might say, "Well, we're all about," for example, we're all about, you know squeezing the bottom line to get something out of our, for, uh, every quarter her ethos and her approach may not work they might go well, i don't know why you're spending time putting together a ted talk you know i wouldn't right, want you to right. spend time doing that at my organization right right but for right. us that's the exactly the kind of thing that we'd want right, right. and so i think it's a, it's a self selection in a really really healthy way because mm-hmm. because um you know, like she probably by showing that to to an organization that um, is looking to hire people that that are after different things in life. You know, she wouldn't actually be selected, even though you know I think she's brilliant, but someone else may not, right? Mm-hmm. But in a way, I think it's great because then you don't end up working at places where you you regret working there because you actually have such a diff you know difference in, in such differences in values right right now it, it's uh, and i think with her portfolio uh, she's just naturally metacognitive yeah. and there's just and it's genuine reflection and i've always thought you know is and, uh, and i know so many of us try to prompt students to reflection uh try and lead them to you know, think metacognitively. Um, she was just almost like a natural at that. And I almost wonder if it wasn't <laughs> just seeing her be that way and just not without any prompting. And that was her own reflections and her, she had her own desire. It was, uh, you know, it was a question she had uh, about her learning mm. that I'm not so sure. I was, it took me a while to think like, is there anything I can draw from her? In other words, is she just such an exception, you know, like just a savant kind of mm-hmm. with that, that it doesn't work for most students mm-hmm. or or can we draw, you know, draw from her? But I have I did use with her permission examples in my classroom. And I think it, it was important, I think, in showing metacognition and students did do reflections um, about that. But one thing that's great and I think adds depth to her reflections is that they're ongoing. And I, and one thing I see with reflections is, for instance, I teach in a London program. It's an accelerated six-week course during the summers. And then on the last day of class, we're all exhausted. We're all this. And then I give them a thing, reflect on your learning. And they're all like, no, I'm tired. It's, you know, it's like, hurry up and reflect, you know, and, and I'm just like, you know, how, how ludicrous. And, but I've talked to students like in September, October, and boy, it really, you know, they've had a chance to really, to really stew on things a bit. And I often think um, it's so good to come uh, talk to students, uh, you know, sometime after they've taken your course. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think it is too, and I, and by the way, I sometimes find that this you know you were talking about this. Some people have this innate way of just naturally they just want to do it, and some may need a little help. And I I I do think that there is a you know like a sort of a motivation level or a a um, uh, a level where where you may not be so much instructing someone but to engage them at the at a more primal level and the way that i looked at this so far is that i've um i've been really interested in how people learn in non-academic environments mm-hmm. such as athletes and yeah. um musicians who 
who who are not necessarily studying to be a musician, but they just are interested in playing music, right? Um, or people that are interested in doing other things, you know, that are very passion driven. Um, and um, I I've been recently talking to a lot of um, athletes that are, that perform at a very high elite level, perhaps even sort of world class level, and many of them are would do things like. I would just find. I just found out that many of them do journals, daily journals of the training of their sessions that they would do, and they would say, no matter whether I, you know, I would play a game or I'd play this match or I would compete in this race, you know, I would afterwards I would write or I would record what it is that I did. That especially when they didn't do well, uh, they would do that and. Um, part of it, it became a habit for them, you know, because they're doing it every day after they practice. But the other half of it was that um, they start to realize that there is a a very material difference in their own performance when they do it versus when they don't. Oh, interesting. So it's a very sort of black and white for them. It's almost like when they do it and when they th- go through this process, yeah, sometimes it's painful. Some some of them are like I said, are elite, you know, world class, yeah. you yeah, know, nice. athletes. So they get to watch their own themselves on TV or on video. They can they would play it back, even painful. They will make notes. They will figure out, oh, this is what happened, and this is what I was thinking during that time. And they actually yeah. analyze it to such a detailed level that they start to almost like. They, they, they're analyzing their own reflection even. How did I feel about this? How can I control yes. that feeling next time it happens? And so, um, and, and it has no doubt have made these um, uh, world-class athletes to perform even better because of that. Wow. And, and, they, and, and, and to me, what happens is... Um, there is certainly something that they they became you know became a habit. They learned it in in a way. Some of them may do it more naturally, but they they kind of learn it. But the learning part of it was easy. It was just like no, just you know, just 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 try it for a week and see what happens. But by the way, they don't do the let's do it once every like three months. They're like every day. You're gonna do it after the session, even if you have nothing. You know, say you got nothing, you feel nothing, um, yeah. and. But after a while, they actually themselves are seeing that their 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 performances has has improved, and so they go, "Oh no, this is good." Kind of a little bit like athletes that go, "Hey, I've always been able to hit the ball in the, in, a, in you know, as a tennis player, but I've never that fit." Once you started playing people who can hit the ball and are fit, guess what? Yeah. You wanted to hang in there. You gotta get fit too, and then they just themselves go and like, you know, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna do whatever it takes because I don't want my lungs to give out um, right. before the next right. person does. Right? It's very interesting. That is really interesting. I I, I wonder um, if I talked to our athletic department at BU. I wonder mm-hmm. if they're doing anything similar. That is that is really fascinating. It, um, what you were talking about reminded me of um this was one of the first years we used ePortfolio and maybe back around 2012 I had the students use the gallery feature to do storyboards mm-hmm. um and uh and some things and write a narrative uh using using images and one of the best ones was from a swimmer mm-hmm. who documented the uh, his race and he broke it down into like into into parts and here's what i was thinking about at huh. this the start of the race and stuff like that and I, I i know he showed it in class and i think we all of us thought well you just go swim you know you just right you right know. right my, my son ran track in high school and i said just be faster than everybody else you know just <laughs> right. i mean what well, is not that hard you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> right are you running the fastest you can you don't yeah, need to yeah, go yeah. slower <laughs> but not not only was this this the most thoughtful thing the student had written yeah. it was really well written and the grammar mm-hmm. errors and syntax are disappeared this was really mm-hmm. really well done so uh yeah that, that is fascinating yeah i actually think that it's it's uh, really interesting because first of all it's very measurable so it's really easy for one to sort of figure out because you know right. people's right time get faster, they, their, their performance gets higher, they can beat people they couldn't beat before and things wow. like that. And then secondly, um, 
you know, just the world of sports medicine and sports psychology has has been um, has improved in the last few decades by leaps and bounds, and partly is because of the funding that is available. Think sure. about today's NBA teams. You pretty much, you know, and like take your take your pick, right? NBA, NFL, you know, soccer, you know, football, yeah. as yeah. the rest of the world refers to it. Um, uh, you know, these these sports have so much resource that oh. it's almost an you know, it's almost like it, you know, if you have to spend, you know, a million, I think I heard something like Shaq, you know, used to, when he was competing, he would easily spend over a million dollars a year on essentially his body, every part mm-hmm. of it, his brain, his mental, you know, toughness, yeah. his, his, you know, his, his, his strength, his flexibility, all of that. Right. And, um, but for them, it, it's almost like, yeah, that's what it takes. And it's okay because they have the resource to do it. But right. what I think we can benefit from is actually we can learn from, you know, a lot of the um, the psychology that comes out of this. And yeah. I've spoken with a, a good number of like sports psychologists and they have the most amazing insights on how people, for example, you know, get themselves out of a rut, how they yeah. can, you know, sort of um, be resilient or how they... Um, how they perform when things don't go their way, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's amazing, and all of the mind games and all of the, yeah. all of those, it, it to me it reminds me of almost like, you know, take reflection, kind of like we were saying about the swimmer, take just swimming for fun to like a whole like different level, you know. Right. Right, right, and I, I think that's uh, I think the whole idea of sports psychology is going mainstream, and it's more accepted. I think twenty years ago, with the macho culture of sports, oh, you need a psychologist, you're soft. Right. But now, I mean, even <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've seen Ted Lasso, the sitcom, yeah, which is really, really funny, and yeah. you have there yeah. the sports psychologists come in, and yeah. it's a you know, and it's a it, it's accepted. When you were talking about the money that colleges. Uh, uh, spend on sports, though, and how how it's a big business. I saw a shocking article the other day that the, uh, Division One colleges spend over five hundred million dollars. They're on the hook for over five hundred million dollars for dead coaches' contracts or no. dead contracts for coaches. Coaches yeah. aren't dead, but they've been yeah. fired. Yeah. And these buyout clauses to get in the new coach. It's Crazy. it's it's astounding the money that's there. So mm-hmm. that, so that maybe is- we'll get a grant to continue research, right? Yeah, and and uh, I I mean I don't I'm not I don't follow a lot of these sports you know for the sake of the sports but I love the the psychology part of it yeah. so I'm I'm just you know feeling somewhat fortunate that someone was willing to put in the kind of resources to research in areas that could potentially be yeah. really beneficial for a lot of other other folks yeah. um, and um, so you were talking about studying abroad you 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 threw in there you were in london you yeah, know yeah. you you do this i know that you do this every year except for last year i guess right um yeah. uh, all this last um in two last two years actually two so. two years 2020 and 21 yeah. um want to tell us a little bit about that it must be kind of nice to be able to spend you know part of your year in uh, in beautiful uh, london Oh, it is, it is beautiful, but it's, I'll tell you, it's a workout for faculty. It's yeah. not a, you know, it's a, it's a workout year. Uh, so I teach in our London program, and these are first-year students that start their Boston University studies in, in the spring semester in Boston, and then uh, in uh, the summer uh, do a six-week, do six-week courses in London. And uh, it's it's a workout, and I think that it's a challenge both for faculty and students. That London is a magnificent city; uh, it's it's amazing. And but we do need to get our work done. So the students work hard, and we work very hard. And sometimes keeping up with the, you know, getting the papers back and responding to work, mm-hmm. it's it's you're wiped out. You're wiped out. I remember I I'll, I'll never forget. I taught with um um a faculty member who was a, a, for her first year and she was incredible. And on the last day talking to students, you could see where she was just exhausted, but she did a great, I told her, you, you just look so wiped out. 
uh, but you did a great job. And there's, I, I told her, I'd use it back to sports analogy, there's an expression in basketball, leave it all out there on the floor. And that's what I told her. I said, you just <laughs> left it out. She had a great year yeah. and she's been an amazing faculty addition to our faculty. Um, so yeah, so it is because I mean, yeah, I'm not going to the tourist sites. And what's kind of a funny, a funny thing that goes on there, um, just from a faculty point of view, is if you have people come stay with you or visit, they're in tourist and love London mode, and you're in work mode. And sometimes right. there's 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 conflicts. And I know some faculty <laughs> members are like telling the families, "Don't come till near the end," or so, something like that. We love you, but right. I need to get work done because it is a workout. But no, it's it's an amazing it's an amazing experience. And what what it really allows you the opportunity to do is some really uh, in depth. Um, experiential learning. And until I got involved in this program, and I've been in the, the London program since 2015, I never really thought much about experiential learning. I think that goes back to the type of uh, of learner I was, where I was more one of those just read it, read, write, and I was not the most hands-on learner. Mm-hmm. And while I did bring in experiential learning throughout my career and kind of kind of understood the value of it. I really got it when I was working in the program. And I'll tell you, if you construct an assignment where uh, you have classroom discussion around a topic, the students do independent research, and then go out and apply that research uh, in real world context, it's, it's, it's a powerful triad. I think, I think it's just remarkable. Um, and, and, and I think that's one thing with study abroad. I, I know sometimes it gets like, oh, the students are just going to party in and it's th- this, and that's at, at BU anyways, that's not the case at all. And, uh, we have conferences with colleagues that are doing just some remarkable mm-hmm. pedagogical work. Right. But, um, I'm my, the, the assignment that I've developed over my career that I'm the most proud of, uh, does involve World War One, and the students will, uh, read, uh, we talk about the rhetoric of World War One. we po- follow Paul Fussell's kind of idea that language changed. It was a, a movement from almost a nostalgic pre-modern to then modern language, uh, questioning authority, a little more uh, risque. And, and, and we kind of look at that. And then we look at representations, uh, uh, how museums, I spend a lot of time, we do some articles on the ideology of museums, why they present things, why they do. And I do a lot with students, um, go to the Imperial War Museum the first week, and I give them a small New York Times article, the review of the World War I exhibit, but then they do further research, and then they go back. And that going back is amazing, because now, oh my God, I didn't notice this before. I didn't notice this before. So say, for instance, they're researching the rhetoric of women in World War One and, and World War One women's efforts. They'll come back to me the first day, oh, I think I'm going to do women, but I didn't remember seeing anything at the exhibit. That's what I'll say the first time. They'll go back, they'll see everything. And they go with so much more knowledge. And then there's uh, I have them go and interpret memorials and monuments, take a look at those in the context. And I had a student who walked by the Edith Cavell monument and didn't really have much to say about it, but then she did her research, went back. It was remarkable. I mean, yeah. the, really, yeah. the, the understanding uh, and to see them. And I have so many students say, oh, wow, I'm never going to look at museums the same way again. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's good. <laughs> yeah. And I think that this kind of experiential learning, one of the things that I really always enjoyed seeing your work and the results of your work is that um, you are the embodiment of someone who is just genuinely excited oh, and me. giddy about your <laughs> students' progress. And I think that there is a... Um, there is a uh, there is a there is a, a sense of you know I, when I talk to you and your student work and even just now you were talking about it it's almost like you spark up when when you are seeing what students are doing but it's by the way that experiential part also comes with a little bit of the it's unknown it's surprising in a good way yeah. it's yeah. it's it's not tightly controlled and micromanaged you didn't have you didn't have these things where it says if you go past this monument i want you yeah. to experience a and b and c and you must do that yeah. otherwise you don't pass my class 
it's yeah. more like you go past it, you don't get it. Okay, well maybe you will, and then that you let you have the confidence to let them go and explore. They then pick the stuff that they might, you know, you might go past ten sites and they might be excited about two, but they go deep into those two once they right. research and might go back and do that. And I think that that there is a, um, it's almost like by you having confidence in your students' abilities to. To develop that interest themselves, you're also en- enabling them to actually benefit from from being sort of a little bit more open ended, a little bit more like you know, it's okay if you surprise me with what you're gonna do with it, um, right? And I think that that um, you know, you were talking about before that you were sort of exposed to this and because you didn't used to do this yourself as a, you know, as someone who went through the, 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 the education system. Uh, but I, I almost feel like that um, whenever I talk to you, these are the things that makes you passionate about teaching. Oh, a- a- absolutely. And it's, it's so rewarding when at the end of a project like this, you'll have students really really kind of excited by the power of doing something truly original, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, that and, and they get, you know, and, and again, they're not going to write maybe a peer reviewed article, although I had one that my, oh my, mm-hmm. um, but they know that they, they, they kind of, and they know the other scholarship that's out there and they, they get a sense they've made a truly original contribution mm-hmm. or, uh, and this gets to curriculum and, and something I feel very strongly about you need a curriculum that they may be able to connect to or have some entryway to. And so one of the topics that they get to choose from was forgotten soldiers. And it was the, the rhetoric over, uh, and and we look, uh, it was the, um, the soldiers from India, Africa, and um, the West Indies. And I had a student who I have to say was, it was uh, not the most engaged student, let's just say. And, uh, but he lit up for this one because he had talked to his grandfather who had served uh, for the British or something, or there was a family legend, great grandfather, forget exactly what it was. And he became really interested in the Indian soldiers in um, in World War One, the effort. And he did remarkable research. He was so, it was so exciting to see a student just who like had his own, uh, you know, we talked about Selma before. He was on a mission that was beyond just finishing this assignment. Mm, he yeah. wanted to know. And uh, I was in touch with him later on. And he said he had a conversation with his father. And the father was saying, oh, I knew sending you to BU was a good idea. You oh. know, and it was just, I was just like, oh, oh, oh. you know, uh, kind of heartwarming. Uh, but again, it was, um, it was really remarkable. It was really remarkable. I, you know, when you, when you, when you get students to have that connection um, and, um, and, and, and curriculum. And um, I don't know if you had a question, but I did want to say something about curriculum. Or Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So um, one thing, uh, and this goes back to the, to the um, we do a, I do a unit in April, uh, n- uh, nature, nature in the individual. It's one of our, one of our uh, units for, for our program. And we do experiential. We t- uh, take the students to Walden. We'll have them read some Thoreau. But what I've really, uh, it, it, and I teach with, in, in, in a kind of a global classroom. One year I had a class of 17 students from 13 different countries. That's awesome. Okay. Now it's not always like that, mm-hmm. but you know, I'll, I'll bring in, in a sense, Thoreau, because I think it's interesting. If you noticed in the in the uh, pandemic, when the pandemic uh, last March and April uh, when went under lockdown, there were so many articles about about Thoreau, but also want to look at how to complicate Thoreau. And so I bring in um, Evelyn White's uh, Black Women in the Wilderness, which is an amazing uh, short narrative that really uh, gets into the idea of you know uh, you know nature may not always be that comforting for for everyone and uh, then I also bring in um, uh, Fabiola Cabaza de Vaca who is the woman who invented the hard shell taco by the way fascinating um, uh, uh, Hispanic American writer and she talks about how they needed to live off of the land which mm-hmm. kind of complicates Thoreau because he, of course, went home to his mother to get cookies. So uh, how the land was hard. And then I bring in Shang Yi, who, whom I love, is a uh, the Silent Traveler series. 
And I will never forget this class as long as I live. I had um, four students from different parts of China and um, did fine, fine work written, but I, orally they were a bit reticent. And we have a small classroom. So if you have 14 in a class, reticent students generally tend to stand down in conversation, but they were doing their work. They were attentive listeners uh, overall. And I don't mean to say, I, I, I almost hate to say they, like all four of them, but all four did. This was how they, how they were in the class. Um, and I brought in Shang Yi. They, we had different essays to uh, essays to talk about about um, Chinese approaches and conceptions of nature. A little bit about Chinese poetry. They lit up the classroom. It was incredible. I, I had a student whose jaw literally dropped, and I looked at her uh, across, and I saw her jaw drop because we learned so much. They now became the experts. And it was just like, and two students I remember after class were like, wow, that was amazing. And, and it, by the way, it wasn't me. It was just activating these students mm -hmm. with, this, with the curriculum. And I thought, this is really what it's all about. This is what, and, and again, I have the joy of teaching a, a truly global uh, group of students. That's, that's, really, that's really amazing. Um, those are amazing examples, and I, I sometimes think that these are the kind of examples that we don't talk about enough in the, you know, just in um, in the in the community because there are um, there are faculty members who probably would have loved to do this, but like you said, they might have been brought up. You know, the, all that they had experienced themselves. Um, had been a more sort of traditional, controlled kind of classroom, um, and and that uh, it's hard for them to relinquish that that sense of hey, I'm the one who's going to know more than everyone in this room, and everything that I do, that's the only way I can perform well as a teacher, and and. Um, and seeing examples like this in more detailed terms like this, I think allow them to perhaps jump out of the shell a little bit, you know, and let go a little bit of that, that, that sense of, you know, that, that playing that role that they've always had, you know, in their mind, this is what a professor needs to be. And, um, and letting the students, you know, kind of grow in directions that, that, that they, that they deserve to, to go to because you know that the interest and the passion drives them that way well i think one thing i learned learned through this is that it isn't just a matter of diversifying the curriculum it's a matter of dirt diversifying the student population mm -hmm. and i think some of the uh, you know in the mass media the discussions among conservative circles about you know d uh, oh diversifying the classroom what's the big deal you know and whatnot it is a big deal uh you know i if i brought in the, these works in a, and i've taught in student populations that are pretty homogenous you know mm -hmm. kind of like <laughs> white people from the suburbs like me you know and the work do, it doesn't activate as much but when you're in a classroom where you have students from all over the world and you teach material from all over the world, it, it, it's amazing. It, it's, it's another level. And for those who don't uh, recognize that, um, I, I feel sad for them because I, I, I just, that they're, they're just so wrong in my mind because I've lived it, you know? And I think for me, uh, you know, I was taught things along the way in my teaching career, and maybe it's because I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I get kind of get it, but then I really get it when I live it. This concludes part one of our conversation with John Regan from Boston University. To hear part two, be sure to subscribe to Digication Scholars Conversations on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Digication Scholars Conversations is brought to you by Digication, a technology platform powering the most innovative e-portfolio programs in K-12 and higher education. Our website can be found at digication.com. This episode was produced by Drew Albanicius. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for watching.